And now to present today's two o'clock program in the Hall of Philosophy, where this week we're focusing on the theme of the fourth gospel. Stay put. The fourth gospel, Tales of a Jewish Mystic. We delightedly welcome back John Shelby Spong, the retired Episcopal Bishop of Newark, and a creative scriptural interpreter and master storyteller. A note that Jack and Christine are delightful people who share Cheryl and my love of global travel. The title of his lecture today is The Fourth Gospel's Way of Warning Us Against a Literal Reading. You will be pleased to know that Jack will be doing a book signing on Friday after his lecture. The signing will take place on the porch of the Hall of Missions, and the books will be sold there as well, and as I added yesterday, if there are any left. So please see the bookstore before Friday. You will also be pleased to know that Bishop Spong writes a weekly column on the internet. If you are interested in learning more about it, there is a sign-up sheet on the table to my well, on my left, where is it? It's back, <laughs> back at the Hall of Philosophy. Okay, so we're in the Hall of Philosophy, so. Ask for it and you will find it. <laughs> Knock and it shall be open. We are most grateful to the Eileen and Warren Martin Lectureship for emerging studies in Bible and theology for support of today's lecture. A lectureship given to honor the loving memory of Warren Martin's beloved wife, Eileen. We are grateful that he and Claudia, his and Eileen's daughter, can't be with us all week, and we're delighted that they are here today. Thank you, Warren. <laughs> Ms. Claudia. Since 1874, Chautauqua has been a forum for courageous inquiry and cultivation of an intelligent faith. We may not agree with all that we hear from this podium, but as Chautauquans, we listen, we challenge respectfully, and we engage with civility. I think this is one of Chautauqua's important gifts to the world, and I celebrate that practice. So now, please join me in extending a very warm welcome once again to Bishop John Shelby Spong. This morning in our chapel service, our magnificent chaplain, Joanna, mm, the wind just blew my, my notes away, Joanna Adams, I do know her name, talked about having a church sign that was so compelling that people wanted to stop a bus and get off and go into church. So I thought I'd tell you about my favorite one, this church billboard that said, quote, this week's special, observe any seven of the Ten Commandments. We began yesterday by trying to separate in your minds the content of the fourth gospel from the rest of the Bible and particularly from the rest of the other gospels. We began to look at the progression of the gospel narratives and how it did not drop from heaven fully written and in the King James Version all at once, divided into chapters and verses. Once the task of separating John's gospel from the rest of the Bible has been made, then we're free to begin to move into the mind of the author of that book to try to determine how he understood what it was that he was writing. Traditional Christianity has most often suggested, at least from the fourth century on, that the gospels were meant to be read as history or as biography. Nothing could be further from the truth in the minds of the original authors, all of whom were Jewish. They understood the power of storytelling. And they wanted to invite you into their interpretive portrait much more than to describe something that actually happened. And in a thousand different ways, the author of this gospel tells us in the text that he is not writing history. He is not writing biography. He is painting an interpretive portrait 
and inviting you to stand inside that portrait. Everybody understood this when the fourth gospel was written, somewhere between 95 and 100, or when it was finished, because the primary people reading that gospel were Jewish people. Christianity did not separate from the synagogue until about the year 88 of this common era. We were born in the womb of Judaism. Judaism is our mother. But by the year 150 of the common era, the Christian movement had moved so far away from its Jewish womb that it had become almost entirely a Gentile movement. So from about 150 to late in the 20th century, the only people that tended to read the Gospels and interpret the Gospels and write commentaries on the Gospels were Gentiles. And not just Gentiles, but they were Gentiles who were ignorant of Jewish traditions, who weren't aware of Jewish liturgy, who did not know how Jews wrote their sacred story. And they had no sense, for example, of what Midrash is. They didn't know how the gospel writers related to and used the Hebrew scriptures. These Gentiles went so far as to suggest that the proper way to look at the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures was to suggest that they were predictors of the future. For those of you my age, ecclesiastical Walter Winchells. For those of you a little younger, Gene Brown, predictors of the future. They thought that maybe these prophets had written hidden supernatural messages into their books that would be literally lived out by Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't understand it was the other way around. The Jesus story was written with these books open so that it could conform to these expectations. The result of that was a literal misreading of the gospel narratives. Biblical fundamentalism, a literal reading of the scriptures of the Christian church, is in the last analysis a Gentile heresy. Most Christians, including me, and I suggest maybe you, were raised inside this Gentile heresy and we were taught that this was normative, that this was the proper way to read the Bible. And so the literal words of the Bible regularly quoted to undergird a literal view of Scripture. That's certainly the story of my life. I was raised in an evangelical Episcopal church in Charlotte, North Carolina. In that church, I was taught that the Bible was the literal word of God and that it was inerrant. But I was also taught that segregation was the will of God. And they quoted the Bible to prove it. I can still remember the text. They taught me that men were by nature superior to women. And they quoted the Bible to prove that that was literally the will of God. They taught me that it was okay to hate other religions, and especially the Jews. They were infidels. And they quoted the Bible to prove it. They also taught me that homosexual people were either mentally sick or morally depraved. And they quoted the Bible to prove it. So much of my life was a struggle to get out from under these church-imposed prejudices supported with the literal words of Holy Scripture. It was not easy. But if I'd not escaped that mentality, I could no longer be a Christian. That was the crisis that I came to. Now, most people, when they get disillusioned with the religion of their youth, just give it all up. Walk away. They don't need that anymore. I decided for some reason on another path. That is, I committed myself to go so deeply into the story of the Bible that I would be able to transcend the limits in which that Bible had been presented to me. And so I began quite deliberately to walk the edges of my faith and to move my life in a different direction. It was the Civil Rights Movement, 
of the 50, late 50s and 60s that challenged so deeply my racism. Martin Luther King Jr. became one of the biblical prophets for me. My sexist attitudes toward women were challenged deeply by the fact that God, in her wisdom, gave me only daughters to raise. And they weren't just ordinary daughters, they were active feminist daughters, aggressive women. I want to tell you, it's not always easy to survive in an all-female household. No toilet seat was ever up. We did have a male cat, but they operated on him. You got the feeling that maybe it wasn't safe to be a male in that household. But as time came, I began to look at life through the eyes of my daughters. And I could see things through my daughter's eyes that I could never have seen through my wife's eyes or through my mother's eyes. So I became a feminist. And then I began to study Judaism. Now, let me tell you, the reason I began to study it was that the kind of Christianity I was raised in, in which I was raised, said that if you enjoy it, it's either sinful or fattening. <laughs> it was sort of a miserable kind of life. I used to say that Episcopalians coming back from the altar rail where they've just received communion look as if they've lost their last friend. Nothing happy about him. I said that to a doctor who was a surgeon once, and he said, Jack, that's not what they look like to me. And I said, what do they look like to you, Ed? And he said, they all look like they're suffering with hemorrhoids. <laughs> and he went on in his indelicate manner to say that every clergyman and every doctor ought to have hemorrhoids. And I said, why is that? And he said, because it causes them to walk with an air of quiet distinction and it puts a look of perpetual concern on their faces. <laughs> and it was Judaism that gave me a sense of how to celebrate life and to live life. I would go to the synagogue, even on Yom Kippur, the day of a penitence, and they were still happy. If they were sinners, by God, they were happy sinners. <laughs> and I began to admire that. And I began to look at the portrait of Jesus through Jewish eyes. And Jesus changed water into wine so a wedding feast can go on, says the fourth gospel. No Christian pastor in my southern childhood could have done that and gotten away with it. <laughs> so I began to move in a different understanding of Jesus. I began to see Jesus in the context of his own Jewish world. And finally, I realized, as one inevitably does in time, that no one chooses his or her sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is not something one does, it is something one is. We do not choose the color of our eyes, the color of our skin, the intelligence quotient of our brains, our gender, or our sexual orientation. They are the givens of life. Now, when I learned that, it certainly seemed true. I don't remember a time when I chose to be heterosexual. I just remember waking up when I was somewhere about 12, and suddenly girls didn't seem obnoxious to me any longer. And I began to do really weird things, like comb my hair, and take a bath a little more frequently use deodorant, anything that would attract the attention of a female. My mother saw this strange behavior going on in her now pubescent son, and she said, the sap has risen, and I didn't have any idea what that meant. <laughs> so step by step, I had to walk away from this literal understanding of the scriptures that had so deeply distorted both my life and my understanding of Christianity. And then I began to turn to the Bible and to study it in a non-literalistic way, 
And if you were to look at the titles of my books over the ages, you will see that that's been a dominating theme. Rescuing the Bible from fundamentalism. Liberating the Gospels, reading the Bible with Jewish eyes. The sins of Scripture. I've wrestled with the Bible for most of my life. And the last book of the Bible that I had to open to this new incredible meaning was the fourth gospel. I outlined some of the reasons yesterday why I was reluctant to pursue this study. But when I did, the fourth gospel became something so dramatically different that it hardly seemed like the same book that I'd been introduced to. When I got into the fourth gospel, I found out that almost on every page, the author of this gospel cries out against reading the text of this gospel as if it's, as if it's literal. So let me point out some of those places. I'm not imposing this idea upon John's gospel. John's gospel screams with this idea. Time after time. The authors of the fourth gospel do this in two specific ways. First, this gospel ridicules, and that's not too strong a word, this gospel ridicules people who cannot think outside fixed religious boundaries. It ridicules people who cannot think outside the literal boxes. Let me say it bluntly. The Gospel of John ridicules fundamentalism and fundamentalist. If that seems like a strange charge, let me take you into that Gospel and look at the data. In chapter 3, John is having a marvelous and much quoted conversation with a man whose name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a leading citizen of the city and of his land. But he is also a quintessential fundamentalist. Nicodemus cannot think outside the boundaries of what religion has imposed upon him. He cannot embrace new truth. And finally, Jesus recognizes this conversation is going nowhere. And Nicodemus doesn't understand a thing that Jesus is saying to him. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you need to open your mind to some new possibilities. You need to embrace a new dimension of what it means to be human. You need to rise so that you can think with a new level of consciousness. In a word, Nicodemus, said Jesus, you need to be born again. That didn't mean have some emotional conversion experience. That meant to embrace a new dimension of what it means to be human and what truth is all about. Nicodemus, the fundamentalist, says, born again? I'm a grown man. How am I going to climb back up into my mother's womb so I can be born again? He's a literalist. He's a fundamentalist. So John subjects him in that story to ridicule. Let's keep reading. In chapter 4, Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman by a well. And the conversation begins when Jesus asks her to give him a drink of water. And she immediately goes to the religious conflict that divided Jews from Samaritans. So Jesus says, give me a drink of water. And she says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a Samaritan, a Samaritan for water? And Jesus adds, or John adds, what most of us are supposed to know, the Jews didn't have any dealings with the Samaritans. And finally, John has Jesus respond to the Samaritan woman in this way. If you knew, said Jesus, who it is that was asking you for a drink, you would ask me for water, and I would give you living water. Living water that would satisfy your thirst forever. The Samaritan woman is a literalist, but she's rather impressed by that offer. 
She didn't like the idea that she had to come draw water every day. This living water that lasts forever would save her from that. If you're a literalist, that makes perfect sense. And so this fundamentalist Samaritan looks at Jesus and his offer of living water. And she says to him, man, where are you going to get that living water? You don't even have a bucket. That's literalism. That's fundamentalism. One will never understand this gospel if one tries to read it literally. We keep going. Next is the disciples. The disciples of Jesus who are the quintessential literalist. Who totally misunderstand. And they misunderstand because their mind simply can't embrace the dimensions that Jesus represents. And in this new episode, it seems that Jesus has been very busy on a lot of travels, and he hadn't eaten properly, so the disciples go and get him some food. I hope not from McDonald's. <laughs> and they try to urge him to eat. And Jesus says to these disciples, quote, I have food to eat of which you do not know. You know what the disciples say? They're all literalists. They're all fundamentalists. They turn to each other and say, I wonder who brought him that food. They couldn't open their minds to new possibilities. That is literalism. And John warns the readers of his book time after time after time that this book will never be understood if you approach it with literal minds. In case John's readers missed that point, he employs another process again and again and again that people in the Middle East and Jewish people would have understood, but Gentiles, it was like going over their heads. If you live in the Middle East and want to communicate to your audience that they're not to listen to this story literally, you use the process of exaggeration. You make the, the details so out of proportion that everybody knows you don't take this literally. That was sort of the Middle Eastern version of what we do in the West. If we want to communicate to people that this story is not literal, we begin by saying, once upon a time, and then we tell the story, and then we say, and they lived happily ever after. And everybody understands that. But if you lived in the Middle East, exaggeration, way out of proportion exaggeration, was the sign that this was a once upon a time story. And you find exaggeration constantly in the Hebrew text. Again and again and again. I won't take you through the whole Bible, and people are a little scared when you start with Genesis. <laughs> but in one of the early chapters of Genesis, there's a story about how the people want to build a tower that is so tall it will reach beyond the sky and they will be able to walk into the presence of God. That's a rather big exaggeration. And so this story is told, but only Westerners later try to treat it literally. The Jewish audience would have understood that. There's no such thing as a tower so tall it will reach beyond the sky. So it's a magnificent story it has a powerful truth. The truth in that story is about how human beings use language to divide ourselves from one another. But it's not literal, and it was never literal, and the author of the Bible knew that was not literal. It's only Westerners that don't understand how you read Middle Eastern sacred stories that think that's literal. That's not the only one. How about the waters of the Red Sea splitting so the whole nation can walk across on dry land? You think they really thought that was literal? Do you have any idea how big the Red Sea is? Do you have any idea what, how much time the Bible says it took the Hebrew people to get through the Red Sea? Well, let me tell you that it, from what we know about the size of the Red Sea and from what the Bible tells us about how long it took them to get through. Those Jewish people had to navigate that sea doing 12-minute miles. Now, I run every morning. I run four, hour, four miles every morning. Around here, I walk. 
And the older I get, the more it takes me more than 12 minutes a mile. I'm about 15 minute mile, which is barely breaking a trot. Imagine this Jewish nation with pregnant women, with babes in arms, with elderly people on their canes, with Warren and his motor scooter. Try to imagine that horde of people navigating the Red Sea in 12 minute miles. Everybody would have known that was an exaggeration. They would not have read that story literally. Literalism is a Western heresy imposed upon the Hebrew Scriptures. And maybe the most e obvious illustration of this principle of exaggeration is the story of the prophet Jonah. Now that's a really great story. God can make, make a fish, he's never called a whale, God can make a great fish that's so big it can swim beside Jonah's boat all the way out into the Mediterranean Sea and at the moment when Jonah is thrown overboard, the great jaws of this great monster are open to receive him. He never even gets wet. Those jaws close down upon him. And Jonah finds himself living in a sort of confined but rather new Mediterranean condominium. <laughs> and this story says he lived in the belly of this great fish for three days and three nights. Do you think they thought that was literal? And then this great fish let out a primeval belch, and out came Jonah. Even the fish couldn't stand Jonah. I don't know what Jonah did. I think he smoked. <laughs> but he comes out, and guess where he lands? He lands on a tiny little sandbar that's conveniently located in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea just to receive him. That isn't a literal story. That's Middle Eastern exaggeration telling people to listen to this story in some other way than through literal ears and listen to its meaning and not its literal content. The story of Jonah is saying the love of God is never based on the limits of your ability to love. And that's a powerful, powerful lesson. In the Middle Eastern world, exaggeration, vast exaggeration, was the warning given to the reader that this narrative was not to be understood literally. This is the Middle Eastern way of saying once upon a time and giving it with a powerful message. Now you and I know about stories that are not literally true. Look at Little Red Riding Hood. That's not a literally true story, but it's a powerful and universal story. It's a story about a young girl reaching puberty and being told that if she doesn't stay on the straight and narrow path, a wolf is going to get her. Could you be more obvious than that? But you don't literalize it and say, and they had to open up the wolf and get grandma out. That's not the way life works. Grandma would have been well digested by that time. That's not the way it works. Literalism kills the meaning. Humpty Dumpty means that there's some things we cannot solve. Not all the king's armies and all the king's men can put some things back together again. I've never been terribly impressed when faith healers cause people who have a limp to stop having a limp. I would be really impressed if they caused people with amputated legs to grow new legs. That would be really impressive to me. But you see, we'd have moved beyond understanding things literally at that point. But now let me go to the Gospel of John and show you how over and over and over again he uses exaggeration in the same way that Jewish authors and Middle Eastern authors have always used exaggeration. Let me go to chapter 2. Familiar story. Jesus does not just turn water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, according to that story. Read the figures. Jesus changes that water into 180 gallons of wine. That's not a little party. And it's not just gallo screw top gallon jug bottles either. It's the finest of the French wines or the finest of the Robert Mondavis. This is a story of great exaggeration. 
You need to understand that John is suggesting that this book, this story, means something other than some sort of miracle story. Go to chapter 5. Jesus doesn't just heal a crippled man. He heals a man who's been crippled for 38 years. The average life expectancy in the first century was less than 38 years. This is a major feat. It's a story of exaggeration. Go to chapter 6. Jesus feeds an entire multitude of 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And when all have eaten, they gather up 12 baskets of fragments. Do you think that's literal? Do you think those people were so dumb that they thought that was a literal story? It's only Western Gentiles that think that. That turn all these stories into incredible supernatural miracles. It's an example of exaggeration. It's the Jewish version of a once upon a time story. But a story with a message. In chapter 9, Jesus does not just restore sight to an ordinary blind man. In John's gospel, he restores sight to a man who was born blind, who never had an ability to see. The text says nothing like this has ever happened in the history of the world. Every Jewish reader would have known that that was an exaggerated story. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It means it's not literally true. But in every other area of life, we know how to talk and communicate truth while not being literal. I could say to you today, and it would be absolutely true, that Robert Franklin is a big-hearted man. But if that was literally true, you should call the ambulance because he's got an enlarged heart. (laughs) We know the difference, except when we turn to religion. And then we're so afraid that if it's not literally true, it might not be true at all. And we might be falling over a bottomless pit. And so we feed our security needs by trying to literalize that which should never have been literalized. And in the process, you alienate far more people than you imagine. They think the Christian story is nonsense. That's not enough data. Go to chapter 11. It's one of those other stories that doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament except in John's Gospel, which means that it's not written until 65 to 70 years after the crucifixion. Imagine suppressing a story like this for 65 to 70 years. That's the story of Lazarus. Now in that story, Jesus doesn't just raise a man from the dead. If you read the Old Testament, you find that Elijah did that, and Elisha did that. That wasn't so spectacular, at least in the minds of those people. But Jesus doesn't just raise a man from the dead. He raises from the dead a man who's been dead for four days. He's been in his grave for four days. He's bound in grave clothes. There's a great stone put over the cave where he's buried. And the text makes it clear that he has already begun the process of physical body decay. Sometimes we don't read the text very carefully. But in that story, when Jesus goes out to the grave, to the cave where Lazarus is sleeping or is dead and buried, his sister Martha says, oh, Jesus, don't take that stone away. King James Version says, for, quote, already he stinketh, unquote. The Revised Standard Version is a little bit more circumspect. It says, already there's an odor. You don't get an odor if the process of decay has not taken over. So here you have Jesus raising from the dead a four days buried, deceased, bound, decaying body. That's exaggeration. And the story says that Lazarus came walking out of that tomb. Now when you say bound in the grave coats, they bound the arms to the side, and they bound the legs to each other, so here comes, here comes old Lazarus out of the tomb. It didn't look much like great resurrection at that point. It looked like Mr. Adams from the Adams family. And nobody, nobody mentions this for 65 to 70 years. Do you think these people are incredulous? <laughs> 
That story says a great crowd of people were there with Jesus, including his critics. Indeed, in John's Gospel, it's the raising of Lazarus that causes the critics to move toward the crucifixion. It's a powerful story, but it's not a literal story. And if you try to read it literally, you'll never understand the depth that this gospel is willing and able to carry us to. So if you and I are going to understand the fourth gospel, we cannot read it literally, and the author warns us on almost every page and almost every chapter that you've got to read this text differently. But we couldn't hear that. Because the only way Gentiles knew to relate to Jewish stories was to try to literalize them. Biblical fundamentalism is a Gentile heresy. We need to understand that. Now, what's the problem with you and me and our generation? The problem is that we have never been told that there's any other way to read these stories except literally. So we think if they're not literally true, they cannot be true at all. So Christianity divides into two major groups. One is those who want to literalize everything, carry us back to the faith of yesterday. And the other is what I call the Church Alumni Association, for whom these literal stories make no sense, and they say, if that's all that Christianity is, I want no part of it, it doesn't speak to my life. And these are the two fastest growing movements in the Christian faith today. And somebody... Somebody has got to stand with one foot in the camp of understanding the scriptures and the other foot in the camp of knowing what it is to live in the modern world and try to bring these two things together. And that's the vocation that I think I've got. And if we are able to do that, then this gospel opens up in a dramatic new way. And through the rest of this week, we begin to show that new way, step by step. What I want to do tomorrow is to look at the characters in John's Gospel. The most powerfully drawn characters in the entire New Testament. And ask the question, how many of them are literal figures who lived in history? And how many of them are John's literary creations around which he's going to weave his Jesus story? And then by Wednesday, by Thursday and into Friday, we will begin to put this gospel into a whole new dimension and see it as a primary call not into religion, but a call into life in all its wholeness. So I hope you'll come back tomorrow, same time, same station. Thank you very much. Now, if we've got some time, we'll entertain some questions. I'd like to follow the same format we had yesterday. Every other question shall come from a woman. So I'd like the women who have questions to line up at that microphone. Oh, we got, you've already reversed it. Women over here, <laughs> men over here. I used to say, if we get to the place where we don't have another woman in line, that's when the questions stop. But that's pretty aggressive. But I'll try, if, I'll try to have every other question be a woman. Because let me tell you a secret. I've found that if you let the whole human family ask questions, you always get better questions. Women are far more intuitive. Men have far too much testosterone. <laughs> so I'll start with you. Thank you for being first. I guess I count myself as a liberal in one of the alumni association. Um, can you expound a little bit on your comments about the fact that the split between the alumni who have left the religion and those who are going to the more fundamentalist. Um, What brings that about? Well, let me say I don't want to be a fundamentalist basher because I was one for a number of years. And I'm not sure I could have grown up without being a fundamentalist at that part of my life. My life was pretty anxiety-filled. It was pretty difficult. And I think if I hadn't had that sense of God's constant presence with me, literally understood, I'm not sure I would have gotten through the adolescent years of my life. So I'm not into being 
a fundamentalist basher. But at the same time, if I hadn't been able to move beyond fundamentalism, I could never have remained in the Christian church. It just would not have been an option for me. We have an opportunity to travel a great deal today to talk about books and ideas and the Bible and Christian theology. And Folks, the Christian church is sick unto death the worldwide. Uh, we went to Belgium a couple of years ago to do lectures at the University of Ghent. Belgium is an overwhelmingly Roman Catholic country. I think there are five Protestant churches in the whole of Belgium. And the churches were all empty. And I had a chance to talk to a professor of theology, or maybe biblical studies, at the seminary that trained priests. This was in maybe 2002 or three. And this professor said that they hadn't ordained a graduate from their seminary since 1998, and they had nobody in the pipeline. And he said the average age of the Catholic priest in Belgium in that year was 73. Well, that's 11 years ago. I assume the average age today is 84. And man, that's getting up there. And it's not just a Roman Catholic problem. We went to Finland. And I think we had 25 people that came to worship, and they were so excited. They said, this is the biggest congregation we've had since Easter. Well, you know, I was sort of depressed at looking out on... 24 people, and there was one Lutheran priest or pastor in that congregation, and he was so upset that his literalism wasn't being affirmed that he began to shout out in the congregation. Now, folks, if your church is dying, if nobody's coming, and you keep trying to do the same thing, that's my definition of insanity. If you keep doing something that isn't working, and expect it to work, even though it's never worked, there's something wrong with your expectations. We were in Paris about two weeks ago. One of my books has just been translated into French, and we were there to help launch it. And I didn't get a very big response from churches, because the church people over there are very few and far between. But I got a great response from the press. We had a three-hour press conference. Those people wouldn't go away. Three hours is a long press conference. But they were so interested that there was another way of looking at Christianity that they had never heard before. These were all relatively young people. That's what gives me hope. We were in Spain a couple of years ago, and again, I had a press conference, and they asked me all sorts of questions, and they kept saying things. I've never heard anybody say this before, especially a bishop. And I thought that was a pretty exciting press conference. When the conference was over, I stepped down off the podium and kissed my beloved wife. That wasn't unusual for me, but that was the big story the next day. <laughs> they'd never seen a bishop kiss his wife because they'd never seen a bishop who had a wife. <laughs> I used to say to the Archbishop of Newark, his name was Peter Garrity, and he was a wonderful friend of mine, and and we, I actually was consecrated in his church. And I looked at that magnificent cathedral. And I said to Peter, well, you guys do have better quarters, but we have better halves. <laughs> if you get outside the south and small towns in the Midwest, Christianity is dying in America. And part of its last gasp is the kind of negative stuff that now is articulated as the primary Christian meaning. When you read the paper, what is a Christian in public life? Primarily he's somebody that is totally opposed to recognizing gay and lesbian people as human. He's totally opposed to any reproductive rights for women. He seems to be in favor of war and capital punishment. It's interesting how the conservative mind works. You can oppose abortion but favor capital punishment. I find that really kind of strange. But when somebody talks about the Christian vote in America, they're not including me. If that's what Christianity is, I can understand why this world is moving away from it. Christianity is not about religion. Christianity is about life. Jesus did not say, I have come to make you religious. <laughs> and I'm glad. But basically, I don't like religious people. And that's like an occupational hazard in my profession. I like whole people and real people and open people and honest people. I think we ought to stop using 
political words to describe divisions in Christianity. We are not conservatives and liberals. There is no such thing as conservative biblical scholarship and liberal biblical scholarship. There's only competent biblical scholarship and incompetent biblical scholarship. There's no difference. Yes. Now let me say in fairness that I can take competent biblical scholarship and interpret it in a conservative way, but that doesn't make it conservative scholarship. So I think we've got to move outside of those words. The promise of the fourth gospel, and so I like it so much, is the promise of the fourth gospel is that Jesus came not to make us religious or moral or true believers, but that we might have life and have it abundantly. If Christianity is not a movement that enhances your humanity and opens you beyond your barriers and enables you to love people that you've never been able to love before, then it is an idol and it is not anything that represents what I believe Christianity is. I hope that's an adequate response. Let me go to my first gentleman. I'm going to have to get one of your recordings. That was pretty good. Um, I have a how and when question in the basis of, I'll give you two very quick examples. One, you're the clergy person presiding at a funeral or memorial service. Right before you start the service, a relative of the deceased gives you a typewritten piece of paper of some Johannine scripture late in the, in, in the gospel. You know Jesus never said it. That I think is probably not the time to make a dissertation with the crowd saying, well, I'm going to read this, but Jesus didn't say it. Or your friends in the Jesus seminar in writing the fifth gospel, what did Jesus say? They come to the part where they're going to stone the woman captured in adultery, and they deal with it by saying in a footnote below, Jesus never said this, it never happened at all, but we like it so much, so we're going to include it. Okay. The question is, how and when? Well, you don't want to be dumb. And it's dumb to start a debate about the Bible when people are in grief. That's just right. plain dumb. Right. The fact is that we read the fourth gospel almost exclusively at Christian funerals. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. That's John. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's John. Now, the question is not whether Jesus actually said that. The question is whether or not that's true. I don't know why we have to get into the debate. I don't think Jesus ever said, I am the resurrection and the life. I think if he had, people would have come after him with butterfly nets. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus walking around Jerusalem and saying, Oh, by the way, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. I don't believe he would make a good dinner partner. Then what are these words about? They're the Christian community meditating on the Jesus experience. And they believe they have found in the Jesus experience that which satisfies the deepest hunger and deepest thirst of their humanity. And so they put into the mouth of Jesus the words that interpret that. And Jesus is the bread of life who fills the deepest needs in human life and the living water that fills the deepest thirst or satisfies the deepest thirst. But the time to teach this is in church and not on Sunday morning in the pulpit. It's a terrible place to teach. Pulpits are always lifted up. You always stand above them. You feel like you've got a mighty fortress around you. And you're supposed to say, thus saith the Lord. When you teach, you say, it seems to me. That's very different. So I think we ought to do our teaching in a classroom setting, in the Hall of the Philosophers. Places where people can process at their own pace, where they can talk back, where they can challenge, where they can say, I don't agree with that. Where they can hear it over and over again from different angles until it begins to penetrate. If a clergyman stands in the pulpit and says, now look, you, you wonderful sheep, <laughs> and I always worry when they call congregations the sheep because that's the dumbest animal in the world 
And of course, the shepherd is in charge of all the sheep. That puts us in a pretty important position. Uh, I'm sort of worried about that approach. I think Christianity insults the brains of their lay people Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We act like we're still in the first century when only one out of a hundred could read. That's not the world I live in. I live in a commuter world. About 85% of the people of northern New Jersey get on a train or a bus every morning and go into New York to work. And they read the New York Times from cover to cover going in and coming back. <laughs> They're not illiterate. And if you want to stand up and be illiterate in the pulpit on Sunday morning, they're not going to be with you very long. So I think that, that what has happened is that the church has refused to engage a proper teaching role, and the time to do it is not in the midst of grief. If anybody says to me, read this, because it'll make me feel better about the death of someone I love dearly, I read that, because that's not the time to be confronting. That would be nothing except hostile. And you never win, you never communicate the love of God by being hostile. Thank you for your question. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you for these incredible presentations. I'm sure you're familiar with Constantine's sword. Yes. I think I read it a while ago, but I think it's so appropriate to bring up with some of your thoughts, and I assume you would agree with me about that. Do you, you recommend the reading of Constantine's sword? Well, the author of the Constantine's sword is a very good friend of mine. He's a former Roman Catholic priest whose father was a general. And this young man, as a Roman Catholic priest, came out against the Vietnam War and had to deal with the fact that his father was, I think, a four-star general. Uh, and he is, he, today he's a columnist for the Boston, Boston Globe, uh, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the New York Times, unless they've recently sold it. And he's just an incredible man in every way. And that book is an incredible book about the relationship between church and state and how Christianity got compromised by becoming incorporated into the, into being the state religion of, of Constantine's era. So yeah, I'd recommend that book and that author anytime. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yourself and other contemporary writers have indicated that the move toward the historical, literal interpretation of scripture is more a product of the last couple hundred years than it was necessarily th uh, since the growth That's of correct. Christianity. Uh, if so, if you agree with that, what, was, what has happened in the last couple hundred years that has made Christians uh, cling so close to the historical interpretations? Well, I think the Christian church discovered biblical scholarship somewhere in the early 1800s. Uh, there was a wonderful professor of New Testament who was 27 years old whose name was David Friedrich Strauss. He taught at Tübingen, And he wrote a book that was published, I think, in 1834 called The Life of Jesus Critically Reviewed. And it went through all the stuff that we know about the formation of the Gospels and that they knew then, but only in the academy. They never let the secret out. And so when the book was published, it scandalized Europe. And Tübingen fired David Friedrich Strauss. That was, his, that was his gift for writing one of the most spectacular books in Christian history. And every other university in Europe refused to hire him, so he was unemployed the rest of his life. He died in poverty, and he died with a great deal of hostility toward institutional Christianity, as you might imagine. But if you'd go back and read that book today, and it's a really tough read, it's about that thick, and it's tiny print in the version I read. It was translated into English by the same woman who wrote Silas Marner, uh, which I think is sort of an interesting fact. But if you go back and read it, it is so conservative by the standards that we know of biblical scholarship today. But all sorts of source study and source document has come in. Uh, for example, we had two German scholars named Graf and Wellhausen who went into the Old Testament and they began to see things that we had never seen before. They were always there. But there's a strain of Old Testament tradition that calls God Yahweh and that centers its life in Jerusalem. And then there's a whole bunch of Hebrew scriptures that calls God Elohim and it centers it in the northern kingdom around Samaria. And these clearly are written by two different kinds of people with two different kinds of agenda. And then there's the priestly code, which comes out of the exile. And then there's a Deuteronomic writer 
And Groff and Wellhausen separated these things from the Old Testament. If you go back and listen to St. Augustine, who was in the 4th century, and who was a premier theologian, but he was certainly not a biblical scholar, he thought the Bible was dropped out of heaven, fully written. In chapter 1 was the creation story of the perfect creation, and chapter 2 was the story of the fall, and you should read them in order because this is the way God wrote it. But we know today that chapter 1 was written some 500 years after chapter 2. That's a very different perspective. How do we know? Because you can read the Hebrew. I could give you Chaucer and Shakespeare and Ernest Hemingway, and you would know they were not written at the same time. Well, the Hebrew scholars can do the same thing to the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, it's very clear that Mark is the first gospel to be written. Why? Because Matthew and Luke copy him. You can't copy him if he doesn't come before you. <laughs> so if there's a conflict between Mark and Matthew and Luke, then Mark is the original. And a lot of the stuff in the New Testament has come out about that. For example, I don't want to go on too long about this. This is another course. <laughs> but, uh, for example, in the resurrection story, did the women see the risen Christ at the tomb at dawn on the first day of the week? Anybody want to answer that? Yes or no? Well, you can't answer that because all the Gospels are different. <laughs> Mark says, no, they didn't see. Matthew says, yes, they did see. Luke says, no, they did not see. John says, yes, they did see. Now, even Jerry Falwell can't put that together and make it consistent. <laughs> so you got something's wrong. And so we're able to piece this together, and Matthew disagrees with Mark. And Luke agrees with Mark and disagrees with Matthew. And so you begin to take Mark out of Matthew's gospel and look at where Matthew changes him and look at where Matthew adapts him. And it's a whole new story. And this is common. This is taught in every theological seminary except maybe Bob Jones University or Liberty Baptist or Oral Roberts University. It's taught in every mainline Christian denomination. It's not, I didn't invent this. I get in, people say, you've dreamed up all this stuff. No, it's just been around about 200 years. We just haven't told anybody. It's about time we treat lay people as if they are not ignorant sheep. And if I had to call the clergy in this audience, and I don't know how many of you are here, to a responsibility, I would say to be teachers of the people of God about the scriptures, and you will find that for every person who gets upset because you're saying it's not literal, there are going to be 10 to 20 people who give it a new look because they couldn't buy into the literalism anyway. And I think we ought to stop being afraid of that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for being here. It's a been, pleasure. It has been a fascinating two days. Uh, in, on the first day, you... you well, perhaps debunked. Could you get a little closer to the mic? You, I'm not hearing you very well. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, a little better. Uh, on the first uh, day, I think you debunked a couple of mythologies that Jesus was not divine. He was not born uh, of a virgin. And then you said a few other things that he did not die for us, he died in order that we could live. And I am wondering ex kind of where you're going, and I am wondering whether, as a Jewish person, I will walk away at the end of the week with a belief in Jesus Christ. It's almost as good as our, our author this morning who said that she got Richard Holloway from Scotland to read something, and he said, almost thou convertest meself. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I would like to, to hold, and, and the, the question is far too complex to address it. Uh, if I had a whole week, I might be able to do a treatment of the virgin story that would be adequate. I'm working a lot on that right now. I'm working on a book on Matthew right now, and he's the one that introduces it. And that book won't get finished until maybe August of 2015. 
So maybe I'll have a chance to talk about that later. But it's too complex to talk about now. And so is the idea on the other end, though I'm going to say more about that on Friday, because I don't think the idea of Jesus dying for our sins is the proper way to understand the cross, and it's certainly not the way that John understands the cross. But let me say to your, your plea, I have a very close rabbi friend named Jack Daniel Spiro. Uh, he's the head of the Department of Judaic Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, and he's such a close friend that he has agreed to preach the sermon at my funeral if he's lucky enough to predecease me. <laughs> and I think I will have the same honor if I'm on the winning side of that struggle. But that'll be a first, I think, to have a, an Episcopal bishop laid to rest with a Jewish rabbi. I guess that's redundant. I don't know any rabbis that aren't Jewish. <laughs> uh, do the sermon. But in our conversations, what Jack Spiro said to me on one occasion, we were doing a, a joint thing at the University of Richmond, and he said, Jack, the trouble with you is you're more Jewish than I am. <laughs> and I think there's some truth in that. One of the great discoveries of my life was that Jesus is a Jew. I don't know why that should surprise people. Now, during World War II, we had Adolf Hitler saying he's really an Aryan. Uh, even Adolf Hitler had a hard time admitting the Jewishness of Jesus because he had a particular thing about Jewish people. So he turned him into an Aryan, and the Virgin Birth story is actually used to justify that. Since, uh, since your relationship to Judaism came through your mother, and she was thought of as a pure virgin, then maybe the Holy Spirit was the Aryan that satisfied Hitler and turned Jesus into being an Aryan. But what people don't realize is that the Christian church was born as a movement within the synagogue. We weren't born independent. We were born in the synagogue. We are shaped by the synagogue. When the, when the Christian story is written for the first time in Mark, the Old Testament is already totally interpreted in the Jesus life. That couldn't have happened anywhere except in a synagogue. People didn't have the Torah in their bedrooms. There was no Gideon society to put the Old Testament in your motel rooms. The only time they ever heard the Torah and the prophets read was in the synagogue. And by the time the Jesus story emerges in the early 70s in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is totally wrapped into the scriptures of the Jewish people. And they were doing the same thing to Jesus that they had done many times before. The Torah is not the only part of Judaism. At some point in Judaism's life, they incorporated Isaiah into their sacred story. They incorporated Jeremiah and Hosea and Amos and Jonah and, and all of the prophets. It was never static. It was always expanding. And I think in the early years of the Christian movement, there is this attempt to incorporate Jesus as sort of the next phase in the development of Judaism. And then some things happened. Some really tough things happened. There was a war. Jewish guerrillas initiated a war against the Roman Empire. That wasn't very smart. The, the Jewish guerrillas were called zealots. The Jews called them freedom fighters. The Romans called them terrorists. I mean, that stuff's been going on in the Middle East a long time. And for a couple of years, it started in 66, and for a couple of years, these Jewish freedom fighters were guerrillas living in the hills of Galilee and they'd swoop out of the hills when they saw a Roman battalion with enough soldiers they could take care of them and then they would disappear back into the, the hills of Galilee. And so it was this hit and run guerrilla warfare. And after a while, Rome got tired of absorbing what we used to call in the Vietnam War uh, a casualty rate that we could live with. It's a strange sort of concept. Because if you're one of the casualties, that's pretty total. But the nation can live with a sort of casualty rate that is tolerable, politically and every other way. But the Romans got tired of that, and so they decided, we're not put up with this Jewish rebellion anymore. So they hauled Vespasius down to Jerusalem, or to the Holy Land, with the great Roman army. And he began to batter the walls of Jerusalem. And in the year 70 of this common era, uh, 
the army of the Romans now under Vespasian's son Titus, because Vespasian had become the emperor by that time, they conquered Rome and they devastated it and they tore down the temple. They tore down, what? I'm sorry, they conquered Jerusalem. And that was the first time that Jerusalem had been conquered since the Babylonians had conquered it about 598. And it was this enormous blow to Judaism. And besides that, the Romans were pretty fed up with Jews because this war had been a bloody war. It's the sort of way people feel when casualties outrun their ability to absorb. And so there was a great deal of anti-Semitism going on in the world at that point. And, and so they began to prosecute Jews. They tore down the temple. They banished a lot of Jews out of Jerusalem. They had to go find other places. I think the Johannine community got banished from Jerusalem about 75 and began to move and wound up in, I think, Ephesus, but I'm not sure of that. But it also presented a problem for the Christians, who were Jews overwhelmingly, but they had not been in favor of that war, and they tried to separate themselves from the Jewish zealots. And one of the ways you separate yourself from the zealots is to say, the enemy, my enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the Christians began to cozy up to the Roman authorities so they wouldn't be caught in this hostile Roman anti-Semitism. And that's where I believe the figure of Judas Iscariot came into the Christian story. I find it interesting that Paul doesn't know that one of the 12 betrayed Jesus. Paul wrote between 51 and 64. Paul says about the, quote, betrayal, only one thing. This is in 1 Corinthians 9, I think, maybe 1 Corinthians 11. He says, on the night when Jesus was handed over, that's the word that they translated betrayed, handed over. Might mean betrayed. It's a little bit looser. That Jesus took bread. Paul never says it was a Passover. It's just on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He never says that the betrayal was at the hands of one of the twelve. And four chapters later in that same epistle written about 54, Paul describes the resurrection. And he said it occurred on the third day and Jesus appeared first to Cephas and then to the twelve. Judas is still among them. So if you read the Gospels, and the Gospels are written between 72 and 100, if you read the Gospels, you'll find Judas, which just happens to be the name of the nation of the Jews, you find Judas begins treated more and more with hostility and disdain. But you'll also find that Pilate begins to be treated more and more as a friend. And that looks like you, you ought to read that in terms of the history. Let me say it radically. I don't believe there was a Judas Iscariot. I don't believe there ever was a figure named Judas Iscariot. I think Judas Iscariot was a mythical figure that the Christians developed in order to put the blame for the destruction of Jerusalem on the Jewish people so they didn't have to pay for that themselves. And in the tragedy of that transference, anti-Semitism was born in Western civilization. Now that's a lot to try to absorb. Uh, I write about that in one of my books. I swear I don't remember which one. I never read them after they're published. <laughs> I'm sick of them by that time. But I think we ought to go back and look at our symbols in a very radically different way. Uh, it, just one further thing, because I'm seduced by my own words. <laughs> if you take every episode attributed to Judas Iscariot in every gospel, you will find that you can find a traitor story in the Hebrew scriptures that is identical to the story that's told about Judas. Judas looks like a composite of every traitor in the Jewish story. Well, people are leaving before I'm through talking, and that's a bad sign. So uh, I'll, we've, got, we've got time left? Okay. Then they're just leaving. Uh, who's next, a man or a woman? Do you know? One final question. A man. Okay. Um, you mentioned the word zealot, and there, of course there's been a popular book out in the last year or so now by Risa Aslan by that title, and he talks a lot about the split between... Uh, James, John, and Peter on the one hand, and Paul on the other, uh, kind of labeling the James group as uh, uh, interested in serving the poor, you might say kind of the social justice crowd versus Paul. 
Uh, is any of that still left by the time the authors of John uh, come around to writing their gospel? Yeah, I think it is. I'll say a little bit about that tomorrow. Uh, but I think that's a pretty significant... There was really a split in their church. And the, the primary people in the split were Paul and James. And who is James? James is identified in Galatians as the brother of Jesus. Now that in itself becomes controversial because there are a lot of people that, that say Jesus never could have had any brothers and sisters. But the gospel is quite clear and we'll talk about that more on Thursday. James is the brother of Jesus and he heads up the most conservative part of the Christian movement that saw itself as part of Judaism, a new development within Judaism. And Paul is the Gentile missionary who is trying to incorporate not just Jews, but the whole world into this Christian movement. And so the tension is set up between those two groups. And, and it's a very real tension. One of my great mentors is a man named, named Michael Goulder, who's an English scholar at the University of Birmingham. And he's written a book called The Two Missions. And one is the Paul mission, and he says the other is Peter. But Peter is subsumed under James in, in this story. Peter and Paul are the first and if you could read the fight about that, if you read Galatians, because uh, Paul doesn't much care for Peter, and certainly doesn't care for James, and all you have to do is read the first and second chapter of Galatians, and the emotions begin to pour out. But that's not the way we read the Bible. We put on stained glass lenses, and so it all looks holy. <laughs> and it's all written in King James English, so it's in the language that God speaks. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's thee and thou, and so you're not supposed to question it. And that's what we've done to the Bible. I don't know whether you do it in your church, but in my church, when the gospel is read on Sunday morning, we hold it up like this and process out in the congregation as if it's to be worshipped. Well, how are you going to study critically something that's to be worshipped? And we announce it by saying the holy gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. And everybody says, thanks be to God. And then we read it. And then we say, no, we don't say here ends the gospel. One buddy said that one time. Somebody stood up and said, God forbid. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we say this is the gospel of the Lord. But our symbols make it so difficult to study the book critically. One final thought, and then I'm through. Have you ever noticed how the Bible is written? It's written in columns. Have you ever noticed that? Do you know what other books are written in columns? Telephone directories, encyclopedias, dictionaries, and the Bible. Does anybody read telephone directories and encyclopedias and dictionaries or the Bible? I think this is a deliberate attempt on somebody's part in history to say the Bible is like an encyclopedia. You go to it for answers. You don't bother to study it. And that's the thing that's been broken down in the last 200 years. And I love studying it. You're kind to let me ramble on. I'll see you tomorrow.